Thank you, Ron. Welcome, everyone. Those of you who are joining us online for another wonderful evening in our You Matter, You Belong, and You Are Loved conference. Have you been blessed so far? Amen. I don't know um, how many of you were here last night. I hope all of you were here. I hope we have more tuning in. But uh, last night, Pastor Conway was here and shared a wonderful message on the woman caught in adultery. And a couple of things that I I think where the themes of what he was trying to get across was he mentioned the key is getting to Jesus. Amen? And I thought the Lord blessed in the way he shared that. And he also said this, purity of heart is not achieved apart from an encounter with Jesus. You know, our world is struggling to fill voids in hearts in many, many different ways. 
But the only way that we're going to find healing is to have an encounter with Jesus. How many of you appreciated the interview with Laura Perry? What a blessing that was. And we had the privilege as pastoral staff to have lunch with her today and hear a little bit more of her story. How many of you were disappointed that we didn't get to hear more of her story? Well, coming up in a couple minutes, Wayne is going to have a very exciting announcement that I'm not going to steal his thunder on. But uh, I want to mention this book. Now, she wrote a book. It's called Transgender to Transform. I started reading it. And I got this from her last evening. If you would like to get a copy of this, um, they'll be for sale, um, able to be purchased. Wayne, uh, Know His Love Ministries, has some at the table out there. For those of you that are watching online, Laura's website is transgendertotransformed.com. And we have it on the screen there. You can go to her website and you can order her book. I started reading this a little bit. She wrote a little note to us in the, in the cover, which was nice. What an incredible incredible testimony to not only what God can do, but to the power of prayer. And uh, there are some videos you can see online uh, regarding her story. You'll want to go and, and look those up and watch those. We were tremendously blessed to be able to spend some time with her and to have her here. Uh, a couple other things. I want to encourage you to share the links. We have links on the website. If you go to villagesda.org, you can share links to the YouTube. You can go back and uh, share the links to the past presentations, you can go there yourself. If you've missed them, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, this week just seems to get more of a blessing as the days and the time goes on. And uh, so continue to share those. We do have the text um, number that I want to put on the screen there, 269-409-1828. So if you would like to make an appointment to speak with one of the speakers or visit with them, you can do that. You can send it. Also send prayer requests here. These are prayer requests that will not be once and done. These will be continued uh, to, pray, to be praying for these individuals and prayer requests that come in on this. And also, if you have questions, so if you have questions, put them on there. There's, pro there's likely going to be a time later in the week or maybe on Sabbath morning, this coming Sabbath, where we'll do some Q&A and uh, answer some of the questions that come in on that. So you'll want to keep that in mind. Uh, there's going to be materials available out in the corridor. You were out there last evening. You saw those materials. Uh, for those of you that are watching online, uh, if you go to the website, I think Michael has a slide here. We're going to put the DVD link up there. And uh, you can go to the main website on the top banner there. You can click, and then there's a blue button. You can go on there, and you can order DVDs. These are not available yet, but you can pre-order them. And uh, once the, the conference is over, we'll be able to get those mastered and copied and sent out to you in the mail. So you can do that as well. I think for those of us that are here locally, the audio CDs of each night's presentations are available up to this point. I think they're available back in the quarter as well. Um, there are some other resources available I want to make uh, you aware of. Of course, we've mentioned here uh, Wayne's book, which is line by line. This is uh, Wayne's uh, biblical approach to talking and thinking about the transgendered issue. And one of the things that might not be clear, Wayne wrote this book as somewhat of a response to the Guiding Families book. And it is a, is a, a line by line, that's why it's called line by line. And what, if, you, if you purchase this book, you will get a complimentary edition of this one so that you can look and compare. Um, and I think if you're wondering, probably the, the underlying main issue that we're talking about is whether or not sin and sexuality is where your identity is found or whether your identity is found in Christ. And you may think, well, what is the significance of that? The significance of that is the heart of the gospel. Whether or not Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ can transform a person's life completely. And so these are not small issues. And we are in a struggle today as to whether or not we're going to allow culture to define how we approach these very complicated issues or whether or not we are going to go to God's word and let God's word guide us in how we deal with these issues. And so we need to be praying, and we need to be asking for the Holy Spirit to guide us in that. Uh, some other resources that are available, uh, Coming Out Ministries, Ron Woolsey, who will be speaking tonight, I'll introduce him in a minute, but he has some information at his table. First one I want to share with you, I'll show you this one first. This is a book called That Kind Can Never Change, Can They? And this is Ron's testimony. So I'd encourage you to get this, he has his table, it's the 
It's really, it's Ron's testimony, but it's really Jesus' story of how he brought Ron into a new life in Christ and gave him a new identity. And so you'll want to look at that one. There's also, for I think, I don't know how many years it was, 10, it might have been more than that, 13 years, I can't remember how many at this point, how many years Ron told me, but he's been answering questions relating to LGBT, gay, these kind of things on his website for many, many years. And so those questions have been compiled in a book. And uh, I've read part of this, excellent, excellent material. You want to look at that book. Uh, There's one other book back there that Ron has available, and there's some other resources. But this is called Navigating the Storms of Contemporary Sexuality, Identity, and Love. And this is also seeking to be a biblical, it is a biblical approach, responding somewhat to the Guiding Families uh, book that was put out. So you want to look at that one as well. It's available uh, on Ron's table back there. And I want to mention, too, I mentioned it earlier in the week. If you have not watched Journey Interrupted, how many of you have seen Journey Interrupted? I should ask that the other way. How many of you have not seen Journey Interrupted? This is a, a, a testimonial video about righteousness by faith. It is the power of God to transform lives. You will weep when you watch this, you will be blessed, and you will uh, be amazed at the power that God has to transform people's lives. And if God can transform others' lives, it gives us hope and courage that he can transform our lives. Amen? And so you'll want to watch, you can can purchase a DVD copy of this in the back. Uh, It's also available on YouTube, and uh, you can watch it there uh, as well. Do I have anything else? I do have one other thing I wanted to mention. How many of you like to give out glow tracks? Oh, I like to see every hand go up in here. We're working at Stevensville on a glowathon. We've been working on that with our personal ministries leader. And uh, their Coming Out Ministries has come out with a couple of uh, small glow tracks. This one's called Unraveled from the Lies of Porn and Sexuality. And uh, so you could pick up some of these to share with people uh, that might be struggling. And this is a little one. It's called Can Born a Gay Be Born Again? And this is Ron Woolsey's testimony. And that's an old glow track. So that might be something to look at when you're back at uh, Coming Out Ministries table. And uh, you could get those things to share uh, with people that you come in contact with. So I want to introduce Pastor Ron Woolsey. As, you have, as we have been blessed every night, you know that God has blessed him with many talents. Uh, we have his picture here on the screen. But he is a co-founder and former chairman of Coming Out Ministries. And he has traveled the world over sharing and telling people about the message of God's love and his power to transform us and to give us a new identity in Christ. And Ron is also authored, as we just talked about, many books. And he is a musician, as we know. This is a concert marimba, for those of you that might not be aware. And it doesn't look like something that travels very easily. And uh, so he has a trailer he pulls and he plays and blesses people with his music. At this time, let's, put, let's look up our scripture reading. So if you have your Bibles there, let's open them. And our scripture reading for this evening is Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 8. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, and we'll read down to verse 8. The Bible says, well, I'll give you just a minute to find that. Philippians 4, 4 to 8. The Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, and whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Amen? Let's bow our heads, invite the Lord to be with us once again. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the precious time that's been set aside this week for us to journey with Jesus as we hear about the experience of others who you have worked so miraculously in their lives. And we invite you once again to be with us, 
to bless those of us that are here in person, those that are watching, and those that will watch these presentations later. And Father, we pray a special blessing upon Wayne and Jeremy as they share and, and talk about how you have the power to transform lives. And then we pray for Pastor Woolsey as well as he shares from your word. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for blessing us on this journey. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please stand and join me as we sing our theme song, Ancient Words. Good evening. Thank you everyone for being here and thank you so much to those of you viewing online. Sometimes when we look out here and we don't see as many people as we hope were here, uh, we get to find out that there are hundreds of people watching online, so it's amazing. And we're getting feedback from people online as well. Well, last night was pretty special, don't you think? It was for me. I had the incredible blessing of talking to, to Laura and spending uh, the time with her while she's been here. We are on our way back to where we were staying last night when the phone rang, and it was uh, Pastor Bryce who said, you know, we just got a call from someone who said, 20 minutes with Laura? Really? You're going to leave us with 20 minutes? What are you guys doing in the morning? Well, 
This turned into an opportunity to come back this morning, and I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit totally inspired this incredible testimony of this woman. Uh, an hour-long testimony, uh, I interview with her this morning. I was so extremely blessed. And the perspective for which I took on the interview was this. What is it like for parents who are, who are hearing about their child who believes that they're a different gender than what they were born into? What is it like for somebody who's considering transitioning into a different gender than the gender that they are? And what is it like for somebody who's already transgender, transgendered and trans, uh, transitioned into that gender and isn't happy there? and wants to find their way out. And so I think you're just going to be blown away. That will be up on villagesda.org tomorrow. And so keep checking the website because I think you'll be incredibly blessed. There is an effort. Uh, if you have wondered, and some of you, you know, we've been, uh, we've been trying to be um, well-intentioned about the Guiding Families book. I believe that those uh, on the Human Sexuality Committee within the NAD were trying to make an, a, an attempt to reach LGBT people, but unfortunately this book comes a, about it from a cultural position. And that's why I was in, inspired and blessed to write line by line to reach the LGBT plus community from a biblical perspective and by doing so, throwing in 19 testimonies of those who have found Jesus Christ. Um, today, we had the incredible opportunity to speak uh, on campus. This is extremely rare. Uh, we spoke to the architectural department and to the students that had finished in an awards ceremony there today. And to pose before them the uncomfortable positioning of uh, putting before them scripture again, which has been resident and it's been the mainstay of our denomination uh, in relationship to how somebody might feel and being invitational about it. Because having been there, I can tell you that, that feelings are extremely real and the, ap the practical application of Christianity isn't, isn't always as, as straightforward as it seems. And so we, we were extremely blessed uh, to put that before them today, and I hope that there are many that will come and attend, if not watch online and see what is this seminar series really all about. Yes, I did um, write the book line by line, and it was brought to my attention that a copy of this needed to be put in the hands of every church in the North American division. That's a $25,000 project. More than half of those funds have been raised. So if you're interested and you see this as a worthy cause, I invite you to come by uh, the Know His Love booth where you can find an envelope that you can mark LBL for line by line, or you can go to Know His Love Ministries, I mean, knowhislove.org, know and you can make an online donation there. By the way, the woman that called in last night uh, to bring this to our attention about our interview with Laura uh, was Jeremy's mother. And so tonight, <laughs> I'm thinking she might think 20 minutes isn't long enough. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce to you this evening, Jeremy Saline. 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 <laughs> Jeremy, thank you for coming. Uh, you are from uh, Oregon. What part of Oregon? Uh, the southern Oregon coast. Right. Coos Bay, North Bend area. Beautiful. Oregon and Washington is very beautiful. Come and see it in the month of summer that we have. It's in August. The, 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 <laughs> I was going to say it's closer to two weeks, but yeah. Yeah, okay, two weeks. Sorry. <clears throat> Jeremy, much like me, you were raised in an Adventist family and... Um, I'd like to know a little bit of, about what the, your feelings were about being raised in, in Christ at that time as a young child. Well, as a young child, I was very close to God. There were many times where 
even through grade school, I would, I would stay up late in bed and pray for my family members, and I just had a very close relationship to God. Great. What, how old were you when you discovered that you were having um, attractions to someone of the same gender? Um, <clears throat> 13, 14, as okay. I was going through puberty. Any, any reason why you thought that might have occurred, or could you figure it out in any way? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, it, it was just always kind of a thing. I never experienced uh, attraction to women at all. Mm-hmm. Okay. Tell me a little bit about, about what you experienced as a child uh, through your school years, and, and when you did discover the same-sex attraction, what kinds of things were running through your mind as someone who is identifying at that point as a Christian? So... Uh, when I was a child, it was the mid to late 80s, early 90s, and as I was growing up, there was a very strong anger and hatred towards the LGBT plus community because that was the height of the AIDS epidemic, mm-hmm. um, and there was a lot of bad things said about people like that, and it came to a point where I believed as, as a child from just listening to people on TV and the people around me that God m- must hate this group of people and that if you were this mm-hmm. type of a person that God couldn't love you. So, how, there, were, there was a point then that in your childhood and experiencing this that you began to exchange your, uh, your ideas of agreement with Scripture with those of culture and it began to capture your attention. What happened? Well, as I... As I as I said, as I thought that that was the worst thing anyone could be. And so when I went through puberty and then I experienced these attractions, it was more of a, well, God obviously can't love me anymore, so forget this, I'm out, sort of okay. thing. So how did you go about in, uh, interweaving yourself within the LGBT community at that point? Well, I was never a big fan of the the cultural aspects of the LGBT plus community. I didn't do clubbing or lots of drugs or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, so you didn't go out to nightclubs or anything like this? Well, and luckily I lived in a kind of a rural area. Uh, um, unluckily, that means that a lot of the times sexual encounters were very anonymous or right. just kind of a hookup culture sort of thing. Via online? Right. Okay. People were scared. It was, it was, even then it was dangerous to be out. Right. And you entered into some relationships? Yeah, over the years. And um, mostly short term, um, although my, the last partner I had before coming to, back to God uh, was about seven or eight years. Yeah. How, how did you feel about God during the time that you were engaged in these relationships? I didn't think much about God at all because, because of that initial conviction or lie that I believe that God couldn't love me. I just, I turned away from him entirely. I kind of wandered through a few religions and then um, because the devil had made it so that the only types of Christians other than my parents that I encountered uh, were kinds that would tell me, you know, you're going to hell. You're, you're, you deserve to go to hell for what you're doing and who you are. I had this rather warped image of who God was. And so by the time 9-11 came around and the new, new atheist movement kind of rose, I, it was easy to convince myself reading those books that this warped image of God wasn't real because it, it's not real. <laughs> That's not who God is. So you yourself then became I, atheist? Yes. I was not a very, believing anymore? A very militant atheist. I wasn't just... I didn't believe. I was, you can't believe either. I was an anti-theist. Okay. So then what was relationship like with your parents? Every time I would go home, there would come a point where my mother and I would have a long debate about what she believed. And, and uh, it, it, eventually we quit doing that because it was just too much uh, stress. Yeah. You know, I found out, you know, today as we were all talking with Laura, is it's interesting that even in something that we know is not turning out well, but, but it's really based in our feelings, we become very defensive because we don't want to be wrong. Right. 
And so we kind of paint it to the, the other side as though it really is truth. It's our truth, and so you, you got to buy into it. Absolutely. And it's frustrating when somebody doesn't buy into it. And, and Christians, parents, often uh, uh, begin the prayer process right. of, of like, wow, you know, the, this is my child. How could this possibly be? Right. The, the, the message last night, Pastor Conway, Intercessory prayer is extremely important. My mother prayed for me all of those years. And, and there were often times in my life, like he said, I, thought, well, I would go to a party or I would go to meet someone or I would engage in, in discussion with other atheists and <laughs> the Spirit would prompt me to correct the things that they were saying about Christianity that I knew so were wrong. So you're playing both sides. <laughs> I, I always told myself, I just want to be correct. But I was always, well, that's not exactly right. You floated um, in and out of relationships, but then you, you found yourself involved in a long-term relationship, right? Mm, yes. Um, did you love that person? Yeah. What, what, tell me a little bit about what that was like. Well, we, I had moved to Portland, Oregon, and we had, I had met this, this man, and we had uh, moved in together. We were buying a house, and um, eventually, uh, that relationship ended, um, but we still live together. Mm -hmm. Okay. While you're analyzing all the different approaches that are out there, again, about LGBT plus people, you run across the information about conversion and reparative therapy. Mm -hmm. what, what were your observations about that? Uh, my observations were not very kind. Um, I spent a lot of time arguing against that, and... Um, I, I still argue against that. There's, <laughs> there's no uh, propitiation for sin in the therapist's office. Right, because developing attractions for the opposite sex isn't necessarily bringing, in, bringing you into a right relationship with Jesus right. Christ. Right, the correct path forward is to bring people into a relationship with Jesus and then encourage them to follow where he leads. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've experienced it all. You've gone down all the roads that you felt were going to provide you the answers that you needed to have a content and, and loving relationship. And uh, one, I'm, one night in the middle of the two weeks of summer, uh, you were out under the stars and something happened. That's right. I, I was contemplating my positions and I was open to questioning it. Several things had happened that I don't really have time to get into that, that made me open to questioning it. And the Holy Spirit, I think, moved on my heart that night and, and made me realize the, the depth of hopelessness of the naturalistic worldview, that if, we're, if there is no God and we're just animals, this is all really pointless. And it was a very hopeless moment. And, and I recoiled from that moment so strongly that I almost fell off my chair where I was sitting on the back porch. Mm -hmm. And when I did, I was caught by a presence. And I knew who it was. Yep. All of these years, and I knew immediately who it was. And love like I had never felt flowed through me. I saw her. And at first I panicked because I'm this big skeptic atheist and I don't believe in, you know, whatever. And so I pushed him away because I was afraid he would reject me first. And because God doesn't force himself on us, he went. And I was just there in the darkness by myself in this hopelessness again. And as I berated myself to accept the truth of naturalistic worldview, I felt this pain come over my head and I felt like I was being separated from something. And it scared me so badly that I threw myself back into his arms, and he caught me again. And as I rested there, I said to him, I'm scared, and I'm confused, and I don't understand. And he said, I know. I just wanted to come to tell you that you are loved. Mm. Amen. And I said, I'm scared, and I'm confused, and I don't understand. <laughs> and he said, I know. There's something that we have to discuss. And I knew what we had to discuss, yeah. and it scared me. And so I distracted with various atheist arguments, questions that I'd had, and finally he said to me, Jeremy, do you know why you're scared of what we have to discuss? It's because you believe it makes you unlovable in my eyes. 
and that is a filthy lie. Amen. I said, all right, I will trust you. And he said, you already know what I'm going to tell you. You already know that, that being gay isn't what I intended, that uh, homosexual acts are a sin, and that makes you a sinner. But, that, but being a sinner hardly makes you special. <laughs> and so... And so he asked me to move home to my, to my mother and to Coquille, and I did. I, I went back home, and a few months prior to my moving there, Pastor Bryce had moved to the church that I had grown up in. And I, pa Pastor Bryce who? Pastor Bryce Bowman. That's right. The, the, our moderator. Our moderator, yes. Yes. And uh, he studied with me through baptismal lessons. I told him how I'd come to be there, and he has helped me through the transition into this crazy new adventure God led me on. <laughs> and something special happened as a result of that. Didn't he baptize you? Oh, he baptized <laughs> me. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, that is the best part. <laughs> so mm. conversion takes place. And unlike, you know, some of us immediately jumped into, you know, going out there and saying, look, there, there's an antidote for homosexuality. But your life changes and yet you just begin to live as an ordinary citizen, a Christian, getting involved in other things within the church. Tell me about that. That's true. I mean, I have given my testimony and preached a little bit, but mostly I busied myself with, um, we do a summer camp for disadvantaged kids in the summer. Um, uh, I just recently started a home, um, outreach homeless ministry to reach out to the homeless in our community and help them. Um, I, I think that keeping busy in the church and doing what God wants me to do is what has helped me in this Amen. journey. Uh, Jeremy, the uncomfortable question uh, for both of us today uh, and for anyone who has left LGBT culture for Jesus Christ is, ha has there been any, any stumbling along the way? Uh, I, <laughs> of course. Uh, I... Uh, we all fail on a daily basis. So yeah. there has been stumbling. There have been times where um, there have been sexual failings, pornography, uh, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. But God still doesn't give up on us, he does doesn't he? doesn't give up on and us. And we haven't given up on God. That's right. <laughs> um, you know, I, I really appreciate that you are here today and you actually have an interest today in recognizing the need for people to stand up and start speaking as it relates to Jesus Christ, your relationship with him and the LGBT plus community. Will you leave something with us about that? That's, that is very true. Um, I have been so blessed by this week that I can, it, it's, it's brought me to tears multiple times because yeah. Other than the preaching, Pastor Bryce preaches a very solid sermon. Yeah. But other than that, I, I, I do not find in our denomination many people that are standing up and preaching redemption. You find um, people who are too, well, I'm just going to say, are too sheltered in moral cowardice, to be quite frank. Yeah. Um, and I think that we need more of this. Yeah. So instead of accommodation, it really is about redemption, restoration, and reconciliation. That's, um, you know, often one of the critiques of the LGBT plus community on, against Christians is that if we would just stop saying that this is a sin, they wouldn't have depression or anxiety. But I tell you, my whole life was defined by depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And the only time I've had peace is when Jesus is in my heart. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeremy. Good evening, everyone. It's really a privilege to be here this evening, this week. 
uh, to enjoy this special time with you and, um, and colleagues and brothers and sisters in ministry, brothers and sisters in the family of God. It's a wonderful experience to be here. I have been given the, the daunting task of unclobbering this unclobber book. Um, you know, by the time I finished making my notes, I had done another line-by-line line book. But I don't have time to go line-by-line. Line. I want to focus primarily on what is really true, and, um, and maybe this will be primarily just a synopsis, but I want to look at this text of Scripture here. Um, and I title this, God's Word, the Way of Life. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. And we, you know, we as Seventh-day Adventists are where we are today with the wonderful light, the light the Lord has given us because we're willing to accept, through the Word of God, reproof, correction, and instruction. And I'd like to open also with this wonderful text. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And I just want to stress that whatever is said tonight, it is out of love. Uh, you know, people call us homophobic because of what we're doing. So I just came up with another word. And you that are PhDs, just, you know, be patient with me. Homo agopic. You know, if we were homophobic, why would we be doing what we're doing? We wouldn't. Phobia is fear. We're not afraid, are we, Wayne? Are you afraid? No, we're not afraid. Why, why should we be afraid? And we love gay people. You know why? We used to be gay ourselves. We know what it's like to be on the other end. And so when we, I have to tell you, when I was in the world, I had a degree in theology and immediately left the church and went into the gay life. And don't hold that against me. I mean, just read 1 Timothy 1 about the Apostle Paul. His history was similar. Anyway, not gay, but equally bad. But while I was in the world with my degree in theology, but not knowing what to do. I mean, I couldn't get a, make a living with that in the world. But I had gay friends that would come to me and say, man, Ron, if I knew there was a way out, I'd sure take it. I wish I weren't gay. I'd give anything to not be gay. Friends, that's who we're working for. There are militant gays. There are political gays. There are gays with an agenda. And you know, we wish them a happy life as much as they can have, but there are so many in that community that desperately want out. That's who we're here for. And the purpose of Coming Out Ministries is uh, kind of threefold, to inspire the church. We do that with our testimonies, and I'm sure you're inspired again tonight, but also to enlighten the church, to educate uh, with information the Lord has blessed us with, not only through our study, but through our experience. By the way, I do have a PhD, but it's an experience. I know you won't recognize it, but I, I claim it anyway. So, but we also want to equip the church. And when we were growing up in the church, we didn't have resources. There were no resources to help people like us. There was no discussion. There was no one to talk to about that we knew we could talk to, felt safe talking with. And isn't it interesting how the Lord works? Here we were drugged through the muck by Satan himself. The Lord finds us, pulls us out, brings us back to the church and says, now you create those resources that you yourself needed. And that's what we're doing. And the Lord has blessed us with amazing resources that are based upon the word of God, science and research, and the voice of reason and that PhD in experience. Okay. Uh, when I left the church in my youth, right after graduating with honors with a degree in theology, um, I remember thinking, you know, I, I just want to be free. 
I, I, these thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. I, it's so negative. I just want to be free. And I felt such freedom when I finally gave in. But you know, it's a lot easier to coast downhill like the broad way to destruction than to trod the narrow way up to eternal life. And I had this sense of freedom there for a while. But then, you know, years later it dawned on me that if the law of God is a law of liberty and I wanted freedom from the law of liberty, what is freedom from liberty? Bondage. I was in bondage. I thought I was free. You know, you can stake an elephant to a, to a you know, stake in the ground of a long chain, and as long as he's content in walking in a circle, he's free. But if he tries to strike out and go out into the jungle, he gets yanked back and he realizes he's not free. I was like that. I was going around in that vicious circle thinking I was free and I was in total bondage. So we have those beautiful texts um, about the law of liberty. Now, when I... One of the, the clobber texts that's brought out in this book, uh, and I'm going to just touch on that right now, as long as I was in the world, and you know, I never thought the Word of God was a clobber book. I just knew I couldn't live up to it. But I didn't, you know, I didn't think that the scriptures were clobber texts. They just were a higher standard than I was willing or able to, to keep up with. But I remember uh, when I went to see some pastor out in California, I'd heard him speak somewhere, and I went to see him and I shared with him my story and I thought he'd fall over backwards in a, you know, in shock, but he didn't. He just kind of blinked and looked at me and opened his Bible. You know where he went? He went to 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. And he sat there and he just read it. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then he read the next verse. And such were some of you, but ye are washed. Ye are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I didn't go there that night to make a decision for the Lord. I just wanted to, I just needed to vent. But then he just looked at me and, you know, I've been in marketing. I was in marketing and I was taught that the first one who speaks when you ask for the sale, first one who speaks loses. So when you ask for the sale, somebody here in marketing, you know what I mean? When you ask for the signature, then you sit there and you be quiet. And if you can't stand the silence and you say, but here's another thing I want to show you. You just bought it back. You lost the sale. Well, evidently this pastor knew that technique and he looked at me and he just looked at me and kept blinking. <laughs> and finally I opened mouth and inserted foot. That's not what it says. I said, you made that up. How stupid of me to say that. He said, no, Ron, I didn't make it up, but I will read it again. And he read it again. I didn't want him to read it again. I got it the first time. <laughs> but he read it again, and I felt myself slinking down into my seat. I mean, I was in that tech. Three times I was going to hell or being lost. I was, I was all over in there. And then he said, and such were some of you. And I just sat there and blinked after that. Then he turned it around. He said, now you read it. And I read it out loud. And that's all I remember of the conversation, except when I finished, she said, Ron, I don't need to tell you anything, do I? You know what you need to do. That was it. I went home that night, and I ended up taking a stand of sorts. My partner confronted me. You're going to really get involved in all that Jesus stuff you've been reading and talking about? And I thought it'd be easy to just say no and get, you know, I don't like confrontation. But somehow I couldn't say no. And I said, yes. He said, I feel like breaking things. And he ran through the house. I could hear things crashing all through the house. And I sat there and finished my dinner in perfect peace. 
That's not when I left the gay life, but it was a step, wasn't it? It was a step in the right direction. Uh, So I never viewed that as a clobber text. It was a convicting text. There, and friends, there is power in the Word of God. And why would we try to explain away the power unless we love our sins? A little warning and admonition here. My people, Hosea, God said to Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's tragic, isn't it? But look at what's more tragic. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. Friends, we better be very, very careful when we talk about Scripture and use it and talk of it as clobber texts. um, If we are rejecting knowledge, we are facing rejection ourselves. You know, I was preaching in church one day, and and I tend to not tiptoe very... (laughs) very well around some issues. You know, when I'm preaching from the Word of God, I feel bold because it's not my idea, it's not my thinking. I can be as bold as I want. If they don't like it, blame him. Don't blame me. And I was, I was having this little issue, and I thought, you know, maybe I came across too harsh. And I said, you know, I apologize if I'm stepping on toes. His hand went up in the audience. It was my head elder. I don't like being interrupted in the middle of a sermon. I lose my train of thought too easily. But he insisted. And he said, Pastor Ron, anytime I come to church and my toes are not stepped on, I feel cheated. <laughs> I said, Amen. Let's, yes, let's go. And so, really, what, look at what we read here in, um, if that's going to work for me, 2 Timothy 3. Yeah, there it is. Uh, I'm going to skip down. To, you, you've got the context there, but all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture. And is profitable. That's a good thing, isn't it? Profitable for doctrine. That's teaching. A lot of churches don't want to talk doctrine. It's just love and acceptance. And we'll touch on that in a little bit. But doctrine for reproof. None of us like or none of us are comfortable with reproof. But if we need it, shouldn't we praise God for it? When we open the Bible, we should expect to be reproved. And if we are not willing to be reproved and corrected and instructed, then why bother? Why even open the Bible? That's what it's for. So, uh, we need to recognize here in 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16, we are, if I can get it to go, there we go. We are reminded of our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him. It says here, in which are some things hard to be understood. Amen. I find Paul, he must have had a PhD. He doesn't know where to put a, find a place to put a period. At the end of a sentence, he'll go sometimes a whole chapter, it seems like. Some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or wrestle, as they do also the other scriptures who are unto their own destruction. So when I think about unclobbering the text and the word of God, I'm concerned, are we resting the scriptures to our own destruction? In 2 Thessalonians 2, 18 to, I mean, 8 to 12, it talks about them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth. Um, this thing works. Wayne, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? It doesn't always work. There. <laughs> Delayed reaction. If I go over tonight. All right. Okay, it talks about them that perish because they received not the love of the truth. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Who? God? You know, God is a gentleman. He's going to give you what you want. If you don't love truth, he's not going to shove it down your throat. If it's a lie you want, it's not that he's going to shove that down your throat either, but he's not going to stand in the way. 
If that's what you love, he will allow you to be deluded, that they should believe a lie, it says, who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Uh, here's a very interesting quote from Great Controversy, page 521, and I'm going to read the whole thing because we as Seventh-day Adventists, I'm trying to set the stage here. If I never get to the clobber text, at least we're looking at the Word of God through a proper lens. Wherever the study of the scriptures is entered upon without a prayerful, humble, teachable spirit, the plainest and simplest as well as the most difficult passages will be wrested from their true meaning. The talks about the papal leaders, how they select such portions of scripture. It's not just the papacy. I mean, look at what's happening today. Selecting portions of Scripture as best serve their purpose, interpret to suit themselves, and then present these to the people while they deny them the privilege of studying the Bible and understanding its sacred truths for themselves. The whole Bible should be given to the people, what? Just as it reads. And I'm stressing that because the author of this book went through what I called exegetical gymnastics. Is that a legitimate word? <laughs> exegetical gymnastics to make the scriptures say what he wanted to believe. But we know the whole Bible should be given to the people just as it reads. It would be better for them not to have Bible instruction at all than to have the teaching of the scriptures thus grossly misrepresented. So, why the book on Clobber? Well, as I read this book, I noticed in the very beginning of the book that the author, and you know, this man obviously has a very loving heart. He's very compassionate. I wouldn't, well, can I say too compassionate? If your compassion causes compromise, is it safe to say you're too compassionate? Uh, I hadn't thought of that before. I may have to chew on that a little bit. But he is very compassionate. He's very loving. He loves gay people. I guess he's homoagopic too. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, but he set out on this quest uh, to align and reconcile the Bible with homosexuality. Now, you're going to see as we go through this, there's a trend today to do that very thing. Uh, I'll go ahead and give, give you a clue because I'm already there, a posture shift. The church needs the shift towards the behavior rather than the behavior aligning with the Word of God. And that's what I saw here. Why? Because as a very young man, he had a neighbor across the street, a lesbian, and she was so nice. And she had a hot tub, and she would let him and his friends sit and play in their hot tub. And he thought, why should a person like that go to hell? You know, he's not an Adventist, so he thinks that way. Why should a person like that go to hell when she's so nice and she's so good? Have we not forgotten the text of Scripture that angel, uh, Satan transforms himself into what? An angel of light and his ministers into ministers of righteousness? You know, we are told... There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Because if we are not in harmony with Jesus Christ, our goodness is as what? Filthy rags. Our goodness may be tainted. Our goodness may be self-serving. Our goodness may be so that we are thought highly of, so that we're liked, so that we're loved, so that we're accepted, so that we're popular, so that we can... Um, self-promote or whatever, but we can't always tell the motive behind someone's goodness. So we don't change the word of God to fit someone who appears to be good because the Bible says there are no one, no one that is good. There is none good but one, and that is God. So if God is the only one good, then we need to, chant, we need to focus upon his goodness and make sure that our goodness matches his or should come through him. And so I understand why this fellow felt the way that he did because he loved this woman and he just couldn't believe that gay people could not have a part in the church, 
could be members and participate in everything. And, you know, at this point, I, I'd just like to remind you, membership in the church is sacred, folks. Attendance is for everybody. But membership is sacred. Why? Because as a member, you can voice, you can vote, and you can be Pastor Ron Kelly, right? You can be the pastor as a member. So you have to be very discretionary with membership because otherwise you may bring in wolves in sheep's clothing with an agenda. So that's why the, the, uh, John the Baptist said, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. You need to be demonstrating that the Lord is changing your life. You know the word conversion is almost a dirty word these days because it's so associated with conversion therapy. We don't believe in conversion therapy, but does it every Christian, true Christian, go through a conversion of the heart? Otherwise, what's the point? I want to look now at uh, the author's methodology in studying and uh, doing his research. And I'm just going to go through it quickly because of the time. He approached the scriptures with an agenda. He was looking for loopholes. He was looking for ways to justify everything he wanted to believe. And there again, that beautiful phrase, exegetical gymnastics. All right, and that he, he applied that. Uh, I couldn't believe some of the, the uh, moves that he could make with Scripture to make it read what he wanted it to read. When I look at it, I don't see it at all. Rather than approaching the Scripture to find what God wanted, he approached Scripture to find what he wanted. He was on a quest to make the uh, LGBTQ acceptable to the church. He said, I want... LGBTQ to hear you are loved just as you are by God and by me the Bible does not condemn them their spot at the table is open uh, so in um, interpreting scripture basically he interprets scripture in light of today's culture is there anything wrong with that Culture changes. God says, I change not. Rather than interpreting Scripture through the lens of culture, we should be evaluating today's culture through the lens of Scripture. You see, it's an opposite approach to Scripture. And it's happening in the world, and it's happening in Christianity, and it's happening in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I see a polarization taking place in our church that is shocking because this very thing is happening People in our own denomination are interpreting Scripture through the lens of today's culture. And he even says, well, how can this stuff apply to us 2,000 years later? This applied to them 2,000 years ago. The whole Bible was 2,000 years ago or more. So with that reasoning, you throw out the whole thing, if we're going to be consistent. Uh, on page 25 of his book, see, we're only on page 25. No, I'm not doing it in order, but... He said, in these six passages, these uh, clobber texts, we're dealing with cultures and languages thousands of years removed from our own, and we are looking for answers to complex questions that in many ways are unique to our time in history. Is there anything new under the sun? How can he say that? I, I think he may have made it up. But could that not be said of any and all scripture that it was thousands of years old? and therefore we don't need it. The author approached his study with four drawn conclusions. In other words, he had his mind made up before he started studying. He looked for scripture to prove his point of view. So I call these false premises, and these are some of them. Homosexuality is not a sin. Jesus never addressed it. Does he not know who Jehovah is in the Old Testament? Didn't Jesus say, I am? Right? Jesus is the I am. Jesus is the one who wrote all of this, the Ten Commandments, with his finger on stone, meaning it's eternal, 
And I heard someone last night preaching about writing sins in the sand. Isn't that just like Jesus? What happened to those sins in the sand? Blew away. But the law he wrote in stone. The finger of God, he wrote in stone the law, he wrote in sand the sins. That's a beautiful thing to contemplate. But the LGBT is natural or normal, in, or it's normal inclinations. The concept of sexual orientation, Wayne, is completely foreign back in Old Testament Bible times. I heard you addressing that the other night. And he says that, no, the Bible doesn't talk about sexual orientation, but it does... It doesn't use the word orientation. There are a lot of words you won't find in the Bible. In the King James Bible, you won't find homosexuality or homosexual. You won't find lesbian. You won't find pedophilia. You won't find all kinds of things. But what you do find in the Bible is the description of the behavior. You can call it anything you want because names change and, and labels change. But the behavior is spelled out. So, yes, the word orientation may not be there, but is the behavior spelled out? Yes. Another thing, he talks about two things that I, I hope I can really touch on tonight. Born gay. Anyone born gay is exempt from scriptural condemnation. Today, we know that homosexuality is a sexual orientation from birth. Well, where did he get that? I think he just pulled it out of the air. I'm going to touch on that. Fasten your seatbelts. Okay. And the other thing is loving, committed, mutual, respecting gay relationships are exempt from all scripture against homosexual behavior. Okay. Here we go. The born gay exemption. I'm just going to give one example of science. These two gentlemen in 2016, I mean, this is like yesterday, all right? Um... McHugh and Meyer, or Mayer. Two distinguished scholars uh, came out with this report after years and years of research, and I'm just going to show you the, uh, talk about the highlights, but I have all kinds of documentation. Their conclusion is there is no gay gene. All right, come on, next page, because I've got some highlights there. All right. Here again, there is no gay gene. Uh, born that way, didn't we just see that? Born that way is not supported by scientific evidence. And uh, they have a, a very lengthy report. But uh, who are these guys? And here again, the hypothesis, the hypothesis that gender identity is independent of biological sex is not supported by scientific evidence. Now, who are these guys? Dr. Mayer is an epi epidemiologist trained in psychiatry and professor of statistics and uh, biostatistics at Arizona State University. Uh, that's where he has been. Uh, Dr. McHugh is arguably the most important American psychiatrist of the last half century. And this is just one recent report. So to say that we know that people are born gay, no, we don't. There is no such thing. There have been identical twin studies, all kinds of studies that totally debunk the born gay theory. Uh, my parents were heterosexual, and yet I turned out gay. How did I get it from them? Their parents were heterosexual, and their parents were heterosexual, and so on and so on. And as the old commercial goes, where would it come from? I think it has to do with the mystery of iniquity and also conditioning behavior. I know in my case, I was sexually molested at a very young age and it totally threw me off track. So some other um, four drawn conclusions. God loves you just the way you are. And I hear people say that all the time and I know what you mean when you say that, but I beg to differ with you for this reason. If God loves you just the way you are, why is he so determined to change you? Right? I like to say he loves you in spite of the way you are. The Bible says while we were strangers, while we were enemies, Jesus gave his life for us to reconcile us back to God. God doesn't love the way we are, love us the way we are. He loves us where we are. 
and wants to take us to his better place. So that's another foregone conclusion. Interesting terms that he used. He talks about being oversaved. My goodness. I think Laura might fall into that category, wouldn't you? Because she talks about God all day long. <laughs> we were talking with her. She said, I used to think, how can I talk about God all the time? She says, now I can't figure out how to stop talking about God. She's oversaved, according to this fellow. Don't tell Laura I said that, bless her heart. She, I was so excited about her. But it means too religious, too focused upon one's faith, too eager to share that faith with others. So if you're sharing your faith, you're oversaved. You need to back off. Okay. Uh, another interesting term. He talks about open, inclusive, and affirming Christians and affirming churches. An affirming Christian, looking up the definitions, is one who expresses agreement with or commitment to, in this case, homosexuality. One who upholds and supports homosexuality, or LGBTQIA+. The acronym just keeps on growing. I just call it the alphabet acronym anymore because it keeps growing. There are several other letters I could add in there that I know are involved, P, P, and P. Polygamy and polyamory and pedophilia and you know and it just goes on um, but anyway one who upholds and supports the same one who supports the same by giving approval recognition and or encouragement well we are to encourage but not encouragement in sin but to encourage them out of sin legally it means to ratify and accept so when you hear about affirming churches you're you're hearing about churches that are ratifying what god calls abomination there are churches that are, are marrying lesbians and then ordaining them as their pastors. And I have those statistics too. Um, ordaining uh, gay couples as pastors. It's, it's incredible what is happening in this day and age. So no matter who you are, he says, you are a loved and accepted child of God. And may you have eyes to see that everyone around you is also a loved and fully accepted child of God. There is something wrong with that. God fully loves the lost. The lake of fire is going to be full of people that God sent Jesus to die for because he loved them. Could he accept them? We are told in our inspired writings that acceptance with God is conditional upon an entire surrender of the will. So this love and acceptance doctrine, where does that come from? How many of you have ever heard of Alberto? Alberto Rivera, uh, Chick Publications. This is the late, great ex-Jesuit infiltrator. And boy, he came out of that movement singing like a canary. He was not an Adventist. I think he became an Anabaptist. Um, but he left Catholicism, and he started, he started admitting and confessing what he had done and look at this, um, his experience was in espionage. He was ordered to join the ecumenical forces under Pope John the Twenty-Third. The Protestants were no longer to be called heretics, but separated brethren, and the communists were no longer our enemies. Now notice, and I've just highlighted down below, but this is from the Vatican-Moscow-Washington Alliance uh, back in 1982, I think it says, or some, can't see from here. And I have no idea where I am with my notes. So anyway. We have successfully infiltrated all of these organizations. And you see a bunch of organizations listed there. Now this is where I may apologize for stepping on toes. So if you want to raise your hand and say you'd feel cheated if I didn't. Okay. <laughs> Thanks to our undercover agents like Alberto Revere himself, we have quietly moved into Christian TV and publishing. We've accepted and have been accepted as teachers, pastors, and evangelists. We are pushing only love and unity to pull us all together. Where do you think this love and acceptance and love and unity comes from? All religions of the world can unite under that teaching under one world leader and all the world wandered after the beast rome is now boasting of this because they've succeeded now the very next graphic in that book is graphic but i'm going to show it to you oops <laughs> he didn't want to see the first protestant groups they moved on were the seventh day adventists 
and the full gospel businessmen. Does that shock you? I was absolutely blown away when I heard that. He's not a Seventh-day Adventist. He's writing for another publication. But he's saying the first people we went, why wouldn't he go after the Seventh-day Adventists? We're the ones with the three angels' messages. We're the ones that can uh, you know, expose the, the man of sin and the mark of the beast and all of those things. It makes perfect sense. Then they went into the Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, and so forth until they were all infiltrated, including the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. All the seminaries, universities, and colleges were next. That was 30 years ago. Now that's what he's saying. Now, I hope, let's just move on. I'm going to just move on. Just chew on that. The disciples were brought together with a with their different faults, all with inherited and cultivated tendencies to evil, but in and through Christ they were to dwell in the family of God, learning to become one in faith, in doctrine, in spirit. Not just love and acceptance. Doctrine. One in faith, in doctrine, and in spirit. The name and effect. Another term that he uses, permission to live in a state of misalignment. Uh, we can talk about that some other time. And then the, he goes into the posture and the posture shift. Anti-gay posture, systemic discriminatory posture toward gays and finding alignment between the Bible and homosexuality. In other words, we need to get the Bible to align up with what we know now is normal in our culture. That's not what the Word of God is for. Um, I just threw in my book there because this book talks about posture shift. I went to one of those seminars by the author, and I always get him confused with the Muppet Man. It's Bill Henson, not Jim Henson, right? <laughs> Sometimes I call him the Muppet Man, Jim Henson, but no, it's Bill Henson. And I went to one of those seminars, and oh, I couldn't, I had to write the book after going to the seminar and cover all of the issues that are addressed in the Guiding Families book also. The Holiness Code, he talks about. Leviticus was written for the priesthood. It's not for you, it's for the priesthood. Um, so that way, it's just for Pastor Kelly and myself, maybe and nobody else, I don't know. Uh, the Clobber Text, if I could touch on them quickly, Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah. Gomorrah. It's, not, it's not exactly historical. A storyteller was telling this story of game rape and inhospitality. And he says, I don't believe that it's literal. Perhaps it's both myth and history. And then he comes up with another similar story out of mythology and said, maybe that's where the writer of the Bible got it. Um, sins of Sodom. Because they talk about the sin of Sodom being inhospitality. No, the Bible says pride, fullness of bread, neither did they strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Uh, haughty, meaning self-exalted, above general society. Friends, that's where we are today. If you are not supporting the gay movement, you're not with it. They have, it is being glorified above general society. Committed, uh, they committed abomination, fornication, and then going after strange flesh. And he never talked about that, but when I was in the gay world, there was a practice called tricking, when a gay person is looking for a new person. Every time they want a new experience with somebody that's totally different, it's called tricking. And a lot of times, they would say, I'm looking for strange. Jude 7, sins of Sodom, going after strange, strange flesh, looking for somebody new. They want sex with a stranger. I mean, it's right there. And if we are just honest with God's word, he tell, says the word abomination doesn't really mean sin. It's a cultural taboo. Uh, then that is not, and in and of itself, a sufficient reason for us in the 21st century to look at the list of abominations in the Bible as sinful. I have a whole list of abominations from the Bible, and I think we would agree uh, I think even he would agree with that most of those are sinful, but why just pick out some of them and say, well, that's not sinful, but this one is because it's a cultural taboo. Um, the clobber text of Leviticus 18 about not lying with man as with woman, uh, he concludes that that's a priestly restriction against blurring the boundaries of Israelite identity. What does that mean? That's one of the plainest texts in the entire Bible 
Uh, you can't get around it. It doesn't say except. There's no exception there. Um, Romans 1 talks about people going after the lust of their own heart, vile affections, their women, talks about the women with women, uh, uh, leaving, changing the natural use into the unnatural, men with men and so forth. And he explains that away as a passage intended to expose Jewish prejudice and reconcile the Roman church. Um, those verses do not provide a blanket condemnation of homosexuality, nor give biblical grounds to condemn any and all same-sex acts. Notice, those verses do not give biblical grounds to condemn any same-sex act, as well as all same-sex acts. That is, that is a violation of the Word of God. Culturally shameful for that day, but not the same for the culture today. It's not a shame today to be openly gay and proud. Uh, but what about the culture of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? We're in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, aren't we? Okay. Three sins especially offensive to God, pride, selfishness, and covetousness. June is coming. You will see that on parade the whole month. Pride, selfishness, and covetousness. Those are three sins that made a devil out of God's covering cherub Lucifer. I think they're roots. And I heard someone talking about clipping the leaves. I always say you don't kill a tree by picking the fruit. You have to cut the roots. Those three sins are especially offensive to God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, I already talked about that one, so you know about that one. But it's dismissed as dealing with prostitution and exploiting others and abusing power and privilege and selling oneself for sexual favors. That's not what that's about. 1 Timothy 1 speaks of them that defile themselves with mankind, and he lumps those two together. Um, time goes so fast here in Michigan. You need an Arkansas clock. Uh, the author's conclusions basically are the same as his, as his foregone conclusions. I really don't need to go through the conclusions because he had his conclusions before he did his research. Does that make sense? So uh, anyway, essentially the same. Consensual sex is beautiful and not sinful. In other words, he actually says if it's consensual, it's okay. Homosexuality, if it's consensual, can be sinful. Well... Homosexual, homosexuality and heterosexuality both can be sinful. But if they are consensual, then it's not. Uh, that is not biblical. Uh, you can be gay and Christian. I've gone through, I've touched on six sermons that I've written about all of this stuff tonight. Uh, but a gay Christian, just think about it. A gay Christian, what comes first, gay or Christ? My sermon is called The Prefix Christian. A prefix is a qualifier, isn't it? If you're a Christian, you don't need to qualify that. I mean, I'm not a pothead Christian. I used to be a pothead, but I'm not a pothead Christian. I'm not an adulterous Christian. I'm not a thieving Christian. Why would I be a gay Christian? You know, all of, you get the point. Um, some... Gays are also card-carrying, spirit-filled, fruit-producing flowers of Jesus. So they need, to bring, they need to be allowed to bring all of their um, gifts into the church. Now notice this. I, I have to share this. Page 43. We're one-third of the way through the book. I can only imagine how it must feel for an LGBTQ person to come out of the actual closet, desperate to be seen, to be heard, to be trusted, to be accepted, and to be loved. And I'm saying this because I used to be there. Let's rewrite it, okay? Let's try it this way. I can only imagine how Jesus must feel. Desperate to be seen. Desperate to be heard. Desperate to be trusted. To be accepted as Lord and Master and Savior from sin. Desperate to be loved. Isn't that where our focus should be? Jesus is the one that is being shortchanged here. He says, if you love me, and then you have all the commandments. Keep my commandments. So I have my own conclusions. And this, again, from Great Controversy 521, whenever 
the study of the scriptures is entered upon without a prayerful, humble, teachable spirit, the plainest and simplest as well as the most difficult passages will be wrested from their true meaning. I read that one already. I put the wrong one there. Let me see if I can find the right one. This is the one I meant to put in there. The truths most plainly revealed in the Bible have been involved in doubt and darkness by learned men who, with a pretense of great wisdom, teach that the scriptures have a mystical, a secret, a spiritual meaning not apparent in the language employed. That's exactly what Unclobbered does. These men are false teachers. It was to such a class that Jesus declared, ye know not the scriptures, neither the power of of God. The language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning unless a symbol or figure is employed. Christ has given the promise, if any man will do his will, he sh shall know of the doctrine. If men would but take the Bible as it reads, if, if that would make angels well, if there were no false teachers to mislead and confuse their minds, a work would be accomplished that would make angels glad and that would bring into the fold of Christ thousands upon thousands who are now wandering in error. And we know that there are thousands upon thousands of gay people who would love to find the way out. And that's what we're here for. Uh, and then just a few texts of scripture to close that I think... We go all night with these, but I just selected, I think, three. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, it's a loving God that inspired that. Why? Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He says, I know. And here's another reason the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's talking about change, about conversion, not therapy, conversion of the heart. And I always like to close with this. This is my little closing. God is love. Nothing is impossible with him. He is mighty to save the whosoevers, like Wayne, like me, like you, from whatsoever, even to the uttermost. Amen. Yes. unto me my life of scarlet my sin and woe covered with his life whiter than snow covered with his life whiter than snow fullness of his life, then shall I know. 
closing prayer, I want us to pray together through a song. And it's hymn number 672. And if you pay very close attention to the words, you will see the connection with the message tonight. <clears throat> and I'm going to have her help me because she's the singer. That was beautiful, by the way. That was a wonderful prayer. Thank you. 672. And let's do this very, very prayerfully. And pay close attention to the words beginning in the very middle of the song. Father in heaven, this is our prayer as we close this evening. Help us to never look at your word as clobber text. Lord, we need your teaching. We need reproof. We need correction. We need instruction in righteousness because we have no idea what righteousness is apart from you, Jesus Christ. So we do pray, Lord, that you will break us, melt us, Mold us and fill us. Fall afresh on us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you to those that have joined us online. And for those of you that are here in person, if you'd like to go out in the quarter, you can look at some of the materials and Talk to some of the speakers. We want to remind you also, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, we'll continue. Uh, Pastor and evangelist Stephen D. Lewis will be with us, and he is sharing a message called Inclusion Through Exclusion. And so we'll want to be here for that, and uh, have a blessed evening and a safe trip home. Thank you.